Did you know Montel uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to forecast spot prices, inflow to reservoirs, wind and runoff river production? We can improve forecasts for your individual power plants anywhere in Europe. Contact us at ai at montelnews.com for more info. Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bring energy matters in an informal setting. This week we delve both far away and closer to home, looking at events in Texas and the implications for the EU power grid, if there are any, potentially lessons to be learned. We will also be following up from a recent episode on grid congestion and how to deal with the increased amount of renewables coming into Europe's power grids in the years and decades to come. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dirk Biermann from 50 Hertz and Matthias Diltai of Zonen. A warm welcome to you, gentlemen. Hello. Hi, Richard. If I can start with you, Dirk, we've seen issues in the US over the last 20 years, you know, now Texas, before their California, PGM, you know, even as far back as Enron. These are high profile failures, of course, for all different reasons. But, you know, what can you say about the US grid model and what can we learn in Europe from what's happened there? Yeah, most obvious is, of course, the reliability issue, how much society is affected by uh, such uh, failures, by such crisis. It again shows how much we depend on electricity, but how much in general we depend on energy. And the interesting issue from a security of supply perspective from a grid operator is that in Texas, we see these what we call common mode failures. So it's not only an issue in electricity production, it is not only an issue in electricity transmission, but also in gas supply. And uh, the combination of the different failures, this combination then produces the the, the crisis. And we have seen the same uh, phenomena in California with the wood fires, where we at the same time had issues in the transmission grid, but also on the production side. So, I mean, you know, it'd be too simplistic to say, or maybe even wrong to say, it's down to too much too much renewables or, you know, too much reliance on, on gas when you don't have the infrastructure there to transmit it to the to the power plants. Would that be correct? Yeah, it's it's by far too, too simplistic to, to say so. Um, it's a combination of very different issues that we see in Texas. And the conclusion for us in Europe should be that we have to be very cautious with regard to phenomena that uh, affect uh, different parts of the value chain. So in a way, it was a perfect storm of many elements. Um, Matthias, what, what's your view here on, on events in Texas? I know Zonen, you're, you're active in, in California, uh, maybe other parts of the States as well. What, what's your view of, of events there? Yeah, first of all, I think it's horrible for the people which are affected. Mm. So it was really bad pictures to see uh, people start burning things to, to heat their homes and stuff. It, and as Dirk said, it, it shows how much we rely on energy. To me, it's a, it's a bad thing that there's kind of a blame game starting now. The, so who, uh, whose fault was it? Yeah, so that's not really helpful. I would say it's a, it's a combination of different things. But the, the major learnings for me are, it's of course a good thing to be part of a of a larger and, and, and stable grid. And, and what, what Texas did and what uh, they decided for is to be, well, not so well connected to the surrounded states. Yeah? So th- they want to stay independent mostly and they want to do things on their own. And uh, this is maybe in such a situation not really helpful. And th- that's completely not comparable to Europe where we have the UCTE grid, which is, to my opinion, a big success story. So that's that's first of all. But then one other important thing which I just recently read about is that it's not only a production issue there, or it was not a production issue due to the weather situation. It's in the same way it's a demand story because what I read is that there was a demand was really peaking up like 18 gigawatts higher than the estimated winter peak mm-hmm. load. 
So people immediately started to use electricity for heating purpose much more than expected. So this is not only a question of the production capacity. It shows um, that it's a really exceptional situation, first of all, and that I think it makes full sense to to have a closer look and we can get some get some learnings from Texas. Absolutely. I mean, would you say that from your perspective, there's not enough solar panels and batteries in, in the county or? It's, of course, helpful to the state. To be, I mean, yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, it's I mean, for each individual home, it, it it's I think if you ex- experience this and if you see this in the media, it's really yeah, making you think of, well, what can I do personally to become a bit more independent and to have more reliability on my on my power supply? But to be honest, I mean, that's not alone the solution. I think it has always, it's making much sense to have a strong system in the background, to have infrastructure, which is in a good shape. It's not helping when now all the individuals start to fight their own game and, and only try to get their their own homes ready. Absolutely. And then and, and you see some horrific stories of, of power bills, uh, daily power bills, uh, it's just sort of thousands of dollars, which is uh, obviously not uh, a very welcome situation at all. But Dirk, if I could ask you, Matthias highlighted the, the sort of isolation of the Texas grid. Is the US grid model as it stands uh, broken now? Will it have to be completely reassessed? I know 50 hertz a jump, but so but you may have some interesting reflections on what, what's happening across the Atlantic. Yeah, of course, the, the European story is a fantastic one. The full integration of the different electricity systems in Europe, the interconnection, the high degree of interconnection that also allows for for major uh, electricity transactions and, and emergency reserve sharing and all that. That's a fantastic story, but that is a story over many decades now, and uh, this has not been replicated in the U.S. so far, even though also in the U.S. we see interconnected systems like the PGM system that is uh, much bigger than the system in, in, in Texas. And indeed, we all know that interconnection, interconnectivity increases security of supply, increases social welfare, increases efficiency. So maybe it's a good advice to look more into this in in, in the States, but uh, it's a bit difficult from outside to to play this uh, game now to blame uh, people. Mm. Because as I said, right now the crisis is uh, the result of a combination of different very unfortunate failures. And uh, we should try to learn from it for Europe and not give too much advice. What would be the lessons here then? More interconnection or making the interconnection more effective to make have gas closer to where it's being used in power plants? Or or what what, what are the the key takeaways for you, Dirk? I would really take the opportunity in, in the US to build a more interconnected system because they have the great opportunity to develop into that direction like we have done in Europe. First point. Second point, be prepared for crises that look a little bit unlikely, but nevertheless, that can happen. And the higher the the combination of unlikely events is in probability, the better you should be prepared. And maybe more awareness there would be helpful. Do you think this would increase the calls for capacity mechanism, for example? Yeah, I think they have uh, capacity mechanisms in place in Texas. Mm-hmm. So I'm not the one who can advise there. But if you were to, Dirk, if you were to redesign the power grid from scratch, what would you do in Europe? In Europe, I think we are we have a power system that is in a quite good shape. To be honest, because we were quite lucky, because we started the, the, the development of the power system for for other reasons than what we see today. In the past, it was more about sharing of reserves. It was about uh, sharing the, the hydro storage facilities in the Alps. It was about security of supply. Nowadays that we see that we can use this fantastic system for more trading, for integration of renewables. So we were quite lucky because we didn't anticipate that when we built the system in the past. But of course, it also means that nowadays we have to further extend uh, uh, the grid, further extend the system, work on new and also more innovative uh, solutions. 
but we have a very solid basis for this. Absolutely. So, Matthias, if I can, if I can ask you the same question, what if you were to design it from the power grid from scratch, what would you put in place? Yeah, I think one major point for me would be uh, to have a more decentralized approach. I mean that that is exactly what is, as Dirk said, as from from the past, what from where we came from was not initially planned. So we have much more uh, structure which is based for, well, which is which is made for centralized units, big units, big power plants, and big consumption, and to 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 connect those. And and for the for the households, they were yeah, they were there as well, but they were kind of at the end of the of the power line. And it's a one. It's it was a one way thing so far, and now it becomes more the uh, the situation that well, the grid is used in in both ways, and 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 that we have uh, prosumers uh, coming up more and more, and that it will become the the normal situation that you don't consume energy alone, but you will be a producer at the same time, or most people will maybe. So this is really something which you could make differently if you do it now again. But still, I think we are in a good transition process to get things handled. Yeah, you know, we're we're on the on the cusp of of big policy uh, occurrences in or policy being being formulated in, in Brussels with the the Green Deal, the Recovery Fund. The targets are clear. You know, net zero emissions by twenty fifty. This all means a lot more renewables coming into the system. But what what are the challenges here involved around increased renewable energy penetration, uh, Matthias? You know, I think in Germany you have a very good word saying Dunkelflaute when there's no wind, no sun, and it's very cold in winter. Uh, how, how do you deal with these instances or these kind of events? Yeah, I mean, we have to distinguish. I mean, the issue of the Dunkelflaute, that's more a technical thing because, of course, yeah, the renewables are fluctuating and you will never be able in, in all the times and all the days to provide enough energy from the renewable sources. That's clear. And you need some backups. You need flexibility. This will be the case. But this is not meaning that we should not uh, build up the capacity on the renewable side. So um, we need a lot of more capacity. And for building up that capacity, to, to my opinion, the most important thing is not to have, I don't know, more subsidies or, or things. It, it's more like to, to make it much easier to get the hurdles down for even more people, but as well companies to invest to to build something up even on a on a small scale yeah on the decentralized approach again to make it just easier if you look at things like regulatory issues like uh, tax uh, issues or how what you have to do as a paperwork to to get things uh, started or the stuff about metering and and anything about that how complicated that can be so this is actually um, to me these are the, the 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 most hurdles we have yeah so it's not about claiming even more money and say we need more subsidies no we need to make it so easy that everyone can build capacity and it's a broad movement so basically cutting the red tape in a sense exactly we we, sh- we should come to a situation where it's a where we get to a new dynamic situation that it's driven by the by the market, by the people, by the participants again, and that it's not so much what are the bland numbers for added capacity. I don't like the approach to 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 have a plan for the next ten years how much capacity should come online. No, it has to be driven by the by the people. What's your view here, Dirk? I mean, you know, with this increased amount of renewables coming online, you already have challenges in your grid area with the amount of wind and the interconnection to other markets. What are the challenges as you see them towards 2030 and beyond? Yeah, of course, it is very clear that the renewables will further grow and they they have to grow in Europe and in Germany. Take alone the 300 gigawatts offshore ambition in Europe, 300 gigawatts. This is really a lot and this will not work with the, the system like we have today that will not work with the market design that we have today. So we have to be ready for change. In Germany, 40 gigawatts offshore by 2040. This is for sure also a very uh, great challenge uh, on a national basis. And nevertheless, we should not forget in the big picture that renewables will remain a scarce resource. We will not cover the full European energy demand by uh, European renewables. So we will further rely on imports like green gas, be it via pipeline, be it via LNG, I don't know, be it hydrogen or be it other uh, carbon neutral uh, fuels. And this will be very disruptive for the energy sector and we have to to prepare for this. With regard to the Dunkelflaute, 
yes, for sure, there will always be longer periods of time without wind and without solar power. And so we need a solution also for these periods of time. And then there are people who emphasize very much the need for uh, gas-fired backup plants. Yes, okay, this is one uh, solution. Others believe more in, in the load follows uh, production philosophy, so more flexibility that uh, adapts to the availability of, of wind and solar power. I do believe that we will need both. So we will have kind of backup system in the future, probably with green gas, with green fuels in kind of uh, gas-fired power plants. I don't know how this will work exactly, maybe on a, on a hydrogen basis. And in addition to that, we will see prosumers who can adapt much better to um, changes in the availability of electricity to the changes of prices in the market. And the combination then will bring the solution for, for, for such periods of time and for the volatility that we see today already and that will further increase. I mean, we talked a little bit here about supply, you know, on the supply side, but what on the demand side with the increased electrification of, of transport, of heating, you know, there's a huge growth and, and as well as the prosumers, etc. What are your projections for demand growth over the next 10 years, uh, Dirk? Because I, I know that the, your colleagues in the Nordic region have had some quite bullish numbers. <laughs> it would be great to have a crystal ball there. And of course, <laughs> we, all know, we all know the different, uh, the different forecasts, the different predictions. And it is really a, a wide range. Some people saying that the increase of demand by electrification will be compensated by efficiency gains. And others see a, a tremendous increase of, of electricity uh, demand. Personally, I don't know. Probably a, a good guess would be somewhere in the middle because we don't know better. And then, then we um, have to prepare for that. I think what we should not forget is that the direct use of electricity is the most efficient use, also the most efficient way to, uh, to decarbonize. And then on top of that, we should electrify where it is hardest to decarbonize without clean electricity, so that we keep a little bit the, the order to decarbonize in, a, in an efficient way. I think that this is important. And of course, I see the, the development of electrification in the traffic sector. That is a given. This is clear. This will come. It's a challenge. At the same time, it is also a chance because, in particular, the new electricity consumers, like electric vehicles, like uh, heating pumps, they will contribute with additional flexibility to the system. And we can make use of this flexibility. And we must make use of this flexibility so it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's also a chance, it's an opportunity for the system. Matthias, your company is very much uh, flexibility, you know, offering flexibility to the market in terms of uh, solar and, and, and batteries. Yeah, I'm just wondering, what's your view here? Uh, and specifically, I, I mean, it, recently we, we talked about redispatching and, and or grid congestion and dealing with grid, grid congestion on, on, the, on the DSO level. But uh, what's your view on the TSO side of things, of, of dealing with these congestion bottlenecks in the most effective way? It's true. Flexibility is, uh, is a key thing for the future. I mean, we are really convinced of that. Maybe to give a few numbers, we have currently something like around 270,000 home batteries in, in, in Germany, which would stand for a capacity of maybe one gigawatt. And um, the authorities in Germany, so the Bundesnetzagentur, they estimate like 10 gigawatts capacity from, from home batteries up to 2030. So that's not our, our numbers, that's numbers of the German authorities. So it is a huge capacity um, and we should make use of it. And it can help a lot, of course, to, to stabilize the system and to make the system work, even if we have a much higher share of re renewable energy then. Uh, so the, the big challenge is, is, is not on the technical side so much, it's more, yeah, how we can integrate these flexibilities properly into the market. And there's uh, currently you face a lot of, of different challenges because things are complicated in detail. And for example, what, what our, one of our, our greatest concern currently is that it's not the same situation if you have a, a small home battery 
which is used for own consumption as well. But you could, of course, offer flexibility to the system. Then you are not treated in the same way compared to a big battery, which is connected to the grid and not doing something else. So it's much harder for the small ones because you have things like taxes and burdens, which are then charged to you, which is not uh, yeah, comparable to the, to, the, to the bigger units. And, and this is really something where we have to find a solution for to enable those uh, smaller units to really take part in the market. I mean, there's a clear statement from the, from the European Union about that, that it should be possible and, and easy for prosumers to, to take part. That's not yet sufficiently respected in the German politics, to be honest. So it's, this is a kind of a plea to, to level the playing field here, uh, Matthias. Exactly, exactly. I think it's a, it's a huge potential which is coming from the, from the household uh, side and that we should not underestimate that. And uh, I mean, th we talk about assets which are there anyway, right? And, and we, we, it absolutely makes sense to, to use them in the best way. Absolutely. I mean, what's your view here, Dirk? I mean, um, when it comes to redispatching, I know it's, it's a very, something that's very costly for, for TSOs. But at the same time, there are, what's the solution here? Is the, we discussed in, in a recent podcast more on the distributed side, but, you know, there's the regulated answer or the, the more market-based answer. And, you know, the market-based has had some, you know, there's some concerns over, over the gaming and different price zones. I mean, what, what's your view here? Maybe before we come to that, I would like to say explicitly that I fully agree with Matthias when he said that we need some changes in the market design, in the market rules to, to better integrate the, the, the small-scale flexibility. This is in our interest, and uh, we, we have to work on this. Currently, we are working within the frame of the NABEC law here in Germany on the integration, the better integration of uh, renewables into the uh, redispatch uh, processes. This will help. This will increase the, the efficiency of the congestion management. But of course, we, we can and we, we have to go further there with regard to small scale flexibilities. Another point, yes, indeed, redispatch is extremely costly, about a billion euros uh, per year uh, right now. Nevertheless, we should not forget that we made enormous progress over the last years. So we are coming from times where we had a redispatch volume of 16 terawatt hours per year in 2015 to 2017. Now we are at 8 terawatt hours. So we made significant progress. Also, thanks to uh, some uh, grid extension in the last years, people tend to believe that the grid is not extended and that redispatch volumes are increasing because of the energy transition. Fortunately, this is not the truth. We are making progress and uh, redispatch volumes and, and, and costs um, are dropping, which is good. Nevertheless, there is a, still a way to go in the grid development plans for 2030, 2035. We plan for the, the, the famous DC uh, lines, long DC lines, mainly from north to south in Germany to connect the, the centers of production, wind power production mainly in the northern part of Germany, or the centers of uh, consumption more in the, in the southern part. This is important, and then we will reach a, a redispatch level at uh, in our plans two terawatt hours per year in 2030, which would be a very reasonable level because in the end, it does not make sense to reduce the redispatch to zero because in a zonal market design, um, it is not the economic optimum to avoid any redispatch. It doesn't simply makes sense to build the grid for the last uh, kilowatt hour. Absolutely. Just a final question to you, Matthias. Is blockchain the answer here for grid congestion? I know there was a lot of hype around it a number of years ago, but it seems to have died down a bit. So what, what's your view here? I know Sonnen is a bit active with, with another TSO, not with 50 hertz. Yeah, it's, it's true. We are doing different projects using blockchain technology. So th this is, of course, this is a a very interesting instrument or tool, but it's not the solution for everything, of course. Maybe I can add some more words about the, about the, the redispatch issue. To, to my opinion, it's, it's, it's quite important to come to a more integrated uh, solution there because we have redispatch and there will be some changes in, in, in Germany later this year. So a lot of more 
a lot more units will be integrated in the redispatch process, which is good. But it's still very focused on the on the feed inside. At the same time, we have a big discussion on new rules on the consumption side, on, on so to say interruptible loads, controllable loads on the consumption side. There's currently um, kind of a political discussion between the car industry and the energy companies mainly how to treat that because it's about charging cars in your home and if this has to be restricted in certain times. To my opinion, the, the major point would be to come to an integrated solution which makes it possible to, yeah, to take care about the feed-in and the consumption side at the same time and just make it possible to provide flexibilities in both directions and have central platforms which, which handle the whole process. Yeah? We will not be successful if we have a couple of very complicated, isolated solutions there, and this will not be the efficient way in the end. Needs to be more holistic or organic. Yeah. Gentlemen, unfortunately, I feel I've only just scratched the surface, if you like, but I think it's a, a fascinating discussion, and I'd, I'd very much like to invite you back at a, at a later date and, and to discuss progress in both in terms of redispatch, in terms of integrating renewables and, and the solutions uh, we need to, to move forward and, and the ones in place as well, of course. So once again, Dirk, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. And Matthias, big thank you to you too. Thanks for having me. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions questions or you know let us know if you if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show you can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com lastly remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on montel news you can subscribe on apple podcasts and spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from thank you and goodbye